Hi, I'm Kieran, I'm Archery GB's Paralympic Technician, and here are my five top tips for compound maintenance. So I've marked where I need my knocking point to finish. So this mark here is the top of the bottom knock. I've got my piece of serving. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go underneath the string and fold it in half so it is right at the top of the mark there. And I'm just going to tie a simple overhand knot. And I'm going to pull it down into position like so. And then I'm going to tie another overhand knot underneath the string and then slide that up against the bottom and then another one on the top and another one on the bottom and then one more on the top and make that a double make sure that's pulled nice and tight and then what we're going to do is we're going to burn these ends off to seal it up. We're going to put the brace and height gauge in just here. Just protects the serving if you do get a little bit flame happy. So we're going to do this. We're going to melt it like so. And then gently push. Like that, so we've got a little bit of a lump still gently heat it up, and voila, one simple knocking point. So now we've done a knocking point, we're going to do a D loop. We've got our D loop material, and we're going to start off by folding it in half, like so. We're going to tuck the folded end underneath the string, we're then going to put these two ends through the loop. We're going to hold on to the one that I've pre-melted, which is at the bottom. And we're going to put that on like so, and then pull this end nice and tight. So there's no crossover there, it's just a loop through the loop. And then we're going to go to the top, and we're going to go, it's coming from this side of the string, and we're going to go down on this side of the string. And then we're going to go under the string, through the bit that you're going to eventually use as your D-loop like so, back round, down under the string, and through. And then we pull that nice and tight, like so. Okay, so, so we know what length this needs to be, because the length between the string and the D-loop is what's important here. We're going to measure it. I'm even going to measure it in modern metric for everybody, so that should be an achievement for me. And we are looking at... 12 mil. So we want the string to this D-loop to be 12 mil. So we're going to make it a lot shorter than that. Like so. Probably about, about half, maybe just over half. And then we're going to melt this end of the loop. Nice and gently. As close as you dare. Being very, very careful we don't set fire to the string because that would be bad. We're then going to put a pair of needle nose pliers in the D-loop, pull it gently, and slide it up to the knock point because that's awful. So now I've actually slid it up to the knock point, we'll put the D-loop pliers back in, pull it gently, have a little measure. Slightly under, so put the Needle nose pliers back in. Give it a little bit more. That's perfect. And there you have your D loop. So we've done our D loop, we've done our knocking point. We're now going to tie in our peep sight. So it's really important to have our peep sight tied in securely because if it's not, there is quite a high chance it'll come out and hit you in the eye or someone else in the face. So uh, we'll tie that in to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, there are multiple methods of tying it in. Um, this is the quick, simple, easy, time-saving way. Um, so fairly simply, like we did for a knocking point, fold this piece of serving underneath the string, 
tie an overhand knot above the string, not too close to the peep sight, and then tie one underneath, and then tie one above, and then underneath. and so on and so on, until you've got about seven or eight knots on there. You need to make it big enough so that you can pinch it in your fingers. If you make it too small, you're never gonna be able to move it if you want to move it, and I'll show you why you'd want to move it in a minute. So we get to the last one, which I'm gonna say is that one, and then make that single overhand knot a double knot, pull it nice and tight, Get our friendly bracing height gauge. I don't know if he's friendly, he hasn't bitten me, so I'm assuming he is. And we're going to melt these two remaining little tags. Like so. And then we're going to do the same at the top. So, overhand knot. Underhand knot, underhand knot, under the string knot. So exactly the same again, till we get seven or eight. So server material wise, um, there's loads out there. I tend to use 3D from BCY just because it's the, I think the easiest and the best material to do this with. It's not the cheapest by a long way. Um, but I find it the easiest to work with. A lot of the softer materials just tend to fluff up and look a bit horrible. Um, but I find this one looks nice and is easy to handle. So I'll finish off with double knot. Put our bracing height gauge in, who may or may not be friendly. Melt these two little tags. Just like that. And the last thing we need to do is tie around the housing. Um, to tie around the housing, quite simply, get your bit of serving, go around the housing with a single hand, single overhand knot. Like so. Go underneath. Like so, back on top, one, two, and then keeping the flame well away from the string. melt it and push it onto the housing and it won't fall out. So I just want to explain the reason why I said we need to make these big enough to move. Um, the reason we make them big enough to move is this. If you've got your peep sight sat at a slightly funky angle and you can't quite get it straight, by playing with the angle and the distance these two ties sit at, you can play with the angle the peep sight sits at. Magic. Okay, so the other thing we're going to do, as we haven't used this bow for a while, um, we're going to look at the blade. And as you can see down here, there's a load of rust on the end of it, uh, where it's always been put away a little bit damp. So what we're going to do is change that, because we don't want a rusty blade, because that would be catastrophic to our score. And we're going to undo these two screws here. So we've undone the two screws, and the, uh, the threads here themselves aren't rusty or anything, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, got the new blade to put on. Um, the problem with two-hole blade rests, or the problem with most two-hole blade rests, is that they are incredibly inaccurate when it comes to putting blades back on again. Um, what most people will do is do something similar to this. Uh, put the blade on, uh, just do the screws up, and then job done. Um, the only issue with that 
is there's a massive amount of left right movement when you put it back so to make sure it goes back at the same point every time what i always do with tool hole rest is do the screws up lightly pull the blade as hard as you can up so the screws are sitting right on the bottom of these holes and then tighten the screws up and now we've got it set so that these screws are right at the bottom of these holes we know it can't move anywhere and we know it's in exactly the same place as it will be next time we put it on right my last top tip is sights what can happen especially once sights have got wet they get really graunchy and horrible and you can hardly move them and they get really stiff and they're just a bit awkward to use what you want to do is Roll your sight round, nearly all sights are like this now, so roll your sight round and find this tiny little grub screw in the wheel. We are going to undo the grub screw, not all the way, but about two or three turns out should do it. Then we're going to put our finger on it, we're going to go to the bottom and we're going to unwind the screw from the bottom. And as you can see, it's now coming out like so. Then what we're going to do is very, very gently take off the top like so and catch this little tiny ball bearing so it doesn't go bing across the room. And we're going to put that there for safekeeping. Um, the reason they get all graunchy is normally inside here, you end up with a bit of uh, either rust or just a bit of grit and dirt. So what we do is we take that out give it a clean with just a cotton bud or something or something small enough to get in there don't put any grease or oils in it because you'll then attract more rubbish to go in it and you'll end up ruining your site make sure this stays dry um, so give it a good clean out um, with anything that's dry and then we just put it back together so once that's clean so put a ball bearing on the top and then push the wheel on top of it and then from the bottom again, we're going to do this screw thread up and let the gaps close in because it's screwed into the wheel at the top. And there we are. Magic. A really nice, clean, freshly clicking sight. And here are my five tips for recurve and barebow arches. Okay, one of the major issues I see a lot with recurve bows is knocking points tied as if they're for a compound. So we really don't want short, fat knocking points on a, on a recurve. We want long, thin ones. The only reason a knocking point is there is to stop your arrow from sliding up and down the string. So it doesn't need to be that big to stop it from sliding. Okay, so we're going to start with the bottom knocking point, which is here. I've obviously already marked it. And um, what we're going to do is when we get our bit of serving, which in this case I'm using BCY 2X because it's, it's just a nice thin material um, and it's fairly easy and cheap to work with. So we're going to make a loop like so. I've got the loop underneath my thumb and I'm going to pinch it between my finger and thumb around the string. And we are going to go one loop around the string and then around the string. I'm going over this this short end here, what we're effectively making is a slip knot. That's exactly the same way you'd start a serving. So once I get to there, I'm just going to pull it tight by pulling this thin, this short loop, and then slide into position before I pull it really tight. Now it's in the right place. Give it a really good tug, and go over and over. And over again. Then we're going to get this thin end, give it another pull, and we're going to pull it out of the way over there. Once we've pulled it out of the way, we're going to go around two, three, four, five, go another six. So what we've got is a long, 
thin knocking point. Make sure you're pushing it up together so it's nice and squished. Now the slightly challenging bit to finish it off, we're going to pull it away from the string. We're going to go over the top of the string and what we've done is we've created a loop here. We're going to go back through that loop. One, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to lay this long end over like so. And then we're going to take the loop and roll it round. One, two, three, four, five. Put the loop tight. And there we are. A nice, thin, flat locking point. The reason we want thin and flat is it doesn't give your tab anything to get ruffled up on. Um, so what we want to do now to get rid of these edges is nice sharp knife and just cut them away. Okay, and then just to do the top one is the exact opposite. The start of a loop. We're going to go around. One. So once you've done your initial few, pull the short end. And it will then pull it tight. Fold it out of the way. Go around. how neat it is at the moment, then we're going to push it all together. Then we create that loop. One, two, three, four, five. Lay it down. Roll that loop over. One, two, three. Four, five. Make sure it's all going together nice and tight. All right, so and then sharp knife. So next is finger sling adjustment. Finger sling adjustment, if your finger sling is too big, like so, so my hand can go almost entirely up and over the riser without too much difficulty, that means the bow is gonna fly really far out of our hands, okay? Although we want the bow to leave our hands, if it's too long, you increase the likelihood of you trying to grab the bow, which is a bit of a waste of time, really. So what we're gonna do is adjust our finger sling. So most finger slings are the same principle. We've got three bits of plastic and then one bit of nylon that goes all the way around. What we're gonna do is grab hold of this middle piece, put your little finger through this loop, grab hold of the middle piece between your finger and your thumb and pull down like so. The reason you put your little finger here is if you pull these bits off the end, they're a nightmare to get back on again. So we've now found in the middle a join. And what we're going to do with that join is we are going to get a sharp knife. And cut a little bit off that side. And cut. A little bit off that side, 
and then you melt the two ends together. Right, to melt the two ends together, hold them so they're nearly touching each other, keeping your fingers well away from them. And gently heat both ends until one catches like, like that. Hold them together so they both melt. Blow them out. Hold it nice and still. You can blow on it gently. And when you're feeling brave, this will be really hot. So don't do it too quickly. Wait till it's cooled down. Push it. So it's flat, like so. Get rid of all the stringy bits. And then put your finger in the opposite loop to what we started with. And then with your finger and your thumb, pull this cover back over. And there we are, we've shortened the finger sling. How to clean your button. Okay, so uh, I've removed the the nut off here just so it's easier to so you can see what I'm doing. Um, but obviously you'll have a nut here that stops your button going against your riser. Um, what we're going to do first of all is we are going to mark where it is. And a simple way to mark where it is is to get a nice coloured pen, in this case gold, and draw a big line on the thread, like so. Then what we're going to do is find our hex keys and undo some screws. Okay, so we're going to undo this one here, not this one. Never undo this one unless you're trying to adjust your button. We're going to undo this one. So put the hex key in. So undo it enough so that you can unscrew this piece. Um, don't unscrew it so much that the grub screw falls out because you'll never find it. Uh, I'm undo, and then inside we have a spring and a tip. Okay, the bits that need to be cleaned are the tip and the inside of this barrel. And the easiest way to do both is a cotton bud with a little bit of either white spirit or acetone on the end. And we're going to dip in here and give it a good scrub around. See, there you go, all that ickiness has just come out. And then give it another good go. And then with another cotton bud, do the same with the tip. Just be a bit forceful. Put some pressure on, you're trying to scrape it down. And then, again with the other end. And just on the tip itself. And then, if you use white spirit or acetone, just leave it for a few seconds um, to let it evaporate. Once it's evaporated, the time to put it back together. So we put the spring and the button tip back through. And then, Screw this back up until that gold line is back where we started. Then tighten this screw up. Like so. It's really important to remember when you're cleaning um, anything that should move in archery. So buttons, um, arrow rests, anything that should be able to move. Do not put grease inside. Um, any grease, WD-40, anything that you think might be a good idea to put inside this to help keep it clean, it won't. All it will do is attract more rubbish inside, meaning your shot will be more inconsistent because you've just got more dirt, grit and grime inside your button. So nothing on the inside. Acetone or white spirit to clean the inside out, let it evaporate and then no more. 
So the position of the arrow on the arrow rest itself. If you look where it's sat currently, my arrow is on the bottom part of the button and the arrow rest arm is sticking really far out to the left hand side. And we want that rest arm to sit almost directly underneath the arrow and we need the arrow to be pushing in the center of the button. To adjust that is really simple. So the position of the arrow on the arrow rest itself. If you look where it's sat currently, my arrow is on the bottom part of the button and the arrow rest arm is sticking really far out to the left hand side. And we want that rest arm to sit almost directly underneath the arrow and we need the arrow to be pushing in the center of the button. To adjust that is really simple. So on this rest, it's this little crub screw here. We're gonna undo that. We're gonna slide that right up to the top. And then we're gonna slide it around. Ooh. We're gonna drop the rest, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna slide it around a little bit. It's about the thickness of my arrow, and it isn't about. We're gonna nip it gently, so I can still pull that out if I need to. We're then gonna lay our arrow against it. And yeah, it's not quite far enough out. It's just, it's just gonna fall straight off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna gently, with my finger, pull it out a little bit. That's still not quite far enough. So again, just gently and there we go. So it's just stuck out to the left hand side of the arrow. So it's just coming out from underneath and the arrow is sat in the center of the button. And then now we've got that in exactly the right place. What we need to do is make sure we give that a nice tighten to make sure it doesn't move. So what we're going to look at in this video is limb straightness adjustment. So that bottom limb you can see is straight on the bite limb gauges. No, I've got three on the bottom limb. They're sold in pairs, but you definitely need more than two to make sure your bow straight. I personally use six. And then if we look at the top here, We are off quite significantly. As you can tell. So what we're going to do is adjust that limb. As you can fairly obviously see, the limb, if you look at the riser here, the limb is leaning to the right. So we need to move it to the left. Um, and the simple way of doing that, easy way to do this, and this is on a win and win. Um, there are other companies that do it this way. Um, I'll show you the shim system in a second, but this is by far the simplest and, in my opinion, the best way of adjusting a riser. Um, it's just a lot less faffy and it's stepless. We're going to undo these two locking screws on the outside and then throw them on the floor so we don't lose them. Uh, we're then going to undo this side because this is the way we want to move it. So if we undo this side, give it a few turns the advantage with this system is you can do it while the bow is strung if you're not confident or doing it while the bow is strung or you think it might be unsafe for you to do so take this ring off and um, but most manufacturers recommend you do it while it's strung and if we wind this side in we can see hopefully the limb Start to move. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way over. Now we've got it in the right position from winding it from this side. We're just going to wind this side back up so that it's tight, and that will then mean the limb can't move anywhere. So that's nice and tight. Once both sides are tight, we're just going to drop these locking screws, these little things here we kept nice and safe by throwing them on the floor. That's why I always do this inside. Um, 
today we're in my kitchen doing it because why not but if you do it outside in the grass it's really easy to drop these screws and they're a nightmare to get hold of the spare parts and once they're both done up tight we're good to go okay so how to adjust the shim system it's I would say a bit more complicated, it's a lot more complicated. Um, you have to de-string the bow. I'm gonna undo this screw here. And then inside here, we have two shims this side. No, we don't. We have three shims this side because obviously I've twiddled with my riser before. And one shim this side. So to enable us to move the limb either way, we can move this shim over here, or we can take a shim from this side, and move it this side. That's the zero position, obviously two shims either side. And we can just move and play about, but it is a case of try it, string it back up, look at it, see if it's straight, take it apart again, take a shim out, swap it over, and it's just repeat and repeat and repeat until you get it right. Um, it does become easier the more you do it, uh, it's not going to be a simple, oh, I got it right first time, or if you do, well done, you're lucky. Um, but yeah, just keep keep progressing, keep going, but just keep taking one shim out, moving it over to one side, and do it slowly, 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 and then eventually you'll get it right, and then you can put it all back together and shoot. And here are my five tips for longbow archers. So first longbow top tip, um, each bow would normally have a maximum recommended brace height and this is normally recommended and written either on the bow itself or in the manual that comes with your bow. Don't exceed this, um, if you do exceed it you've got a very high likelihood of cracking your bow. So as you can see on both these bows there's wear marks on the bow itself from where the arrow passes. On this one we've got an arrow pass inset into the bow so that's a piece of horn that's set in so that's not really having any effect on the bow itself although it's cut through the varnish it doesn't really matter too much because it's only going down onto bone. On here where it's cut through the varnish that's actually open wood so what we don't want now is any water to get near here because it will ingress into the bow and damage it. Um, so what I would now need to do is speak to the person that made the bow and ask them what this finish is. It's either going to be some kind of varnish or an oil. And in this case, it's a varnish. So what I'll do is find out what varnish it is and then just cover it up again to stop any water ingress. So as you can see, the bow at the top of the screen here is nice and straight and the bow at the bottom of the screen here is very, very bent. The reason is this is my bow um, and when I'm shooting it, I'll shoot it and then leave it strung for several hours without using it. Whereas this one here isn't my bow, it's actually looked after um, and it the has the string taken off it when it's not being used for more than half an hour or so. So to keep your bow in tip top shape, when you're not used, going to use it for about half an hour or more, take the string off it and let it relax. So it's really important if you haven't used your bow for a long time or just every time you get it out, just double check the horn knocks, make sure there's no cracks. Um, if there are any cracks, you need to immediately not shoot it and uh, find a bowyer or the person that made the bow and see if they can fix it. Um, the other thing I always tend to look out for is just any sharp edges on here because the worst thing we want to do is be at full draw and then find that there's a sharp edge in here because our string's snapped. Top tip for fletching feathers onto a round shaft. This works for wooden arrows and for metal arrows, um, but especially on wooden ones, you have a nice flat edge on the bottom of the feather, unlike on a plastic vein where you have a nice V shape that then pushes over the top of the round shaft and glues nicely. This flat edge does not want to stick to the round edge here. So what we do is once we've stuck the vein on using our fletching jig, we will then take the clamp off and then put a little bead of glue all the way along this edge here and that will stop the feather from lifting. <laughs> 